Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. Let's talk about cinematics. I know I said we'd talk about undead or politics, and we will do both of those later, but I'm always trying to think of what is the most useful thing I can make a video about, and when I was remembering something that happened in my recently finished Night Below campaign, I went, aha! You know what I mean by cinematics, right? It's those moments in a video game where there's no more gameplay, and for a little while, typically like a minute and a half, you are dropped into a narrative state where you're not in control of your player. The things that happen in the cinematic may be informed by the decisions you made during gameplay, but otherwise the cinematic is a non-gameplay moment. This is related to that notion of taking agency away from the players, and I'm essentially giving you permission to do it as long as your players can trust you. And this is me in my Night Below campaign learning the lesson from the catastrophe video that we made, like, I was it a year ago? I don't remember. I'll try to put a card up here that you can click on if you haven't seen it, if you're not familiar with it. But the, the shorthand of what happened in the catastrophe video was I killed, I executed, I had an NPC execute one of the players, my friend Phil's character, the wizard Skoros, in a situation that developed very badly. And uh, the lesson from that video, so you don't have to watch the whole thing, by the way, the lesson lesson from that video was I had branched the party into two. Uh, the main group was in the process of being arrested. And one of the players, uh, TJ's character Keck, was at the blacksmith and was in the process of making contact with the Thieves Guild and getting the key that would allow him to break the characters out of jail. Now, because I literally took TJ into another room and we roleplayed this whole thing, the players in jail did not know this. So TJ returns to the group and he's super excited that he's going to have this like top secret mission to go and rescue the characters, but the characters, the other players did not know that he had that power. So they felt like once they were arrested they felt like we're all going to be executed unless we find a way out of this it's up to us they thought this is an important point they thought it's up to us to get ourselves out of here and they asked me can can describe the jail cell can you draw it for us and when i drew it for them that was the sign that was the biggest mistake that was the sign that the combat could happen here i should not have done that furthermore what i should have done was i should have just put them on hold and switched to tj and they would have got to watch tj use the key and subterfuge to get in and and as soon as soon if I had done that, it would have been seconds, seconds after we switched back to TJ at the table with the rest of them and me role playing. OK, what are you going to do, TJ? What's Keck going to do with this key and him trying to talk his way into the castle or maybe get arrested and then pull out the key? The players would go, oh, oh, I can relax. I can relax. It's not up to me. It's not up to us to get ourselves out of this. Matt knows what's going on. Matt has a plan and it involves TJ. It's up to TJ to get out of the, uh, to get us out of this. And that would have been a lot of fun, I think. And nobody would have died. But that's not what happened. And it was a miserable evening. And I avoided that exact same situation later by deploying a cinematic. The players were a night below and they had been captured by the Lords of the Darrow. These were five ninth to 11th level spellcasters. Because they were much higher level than the players, they smoked the players. And the session ended with the players being captives of the Darrow. Now, the players correctly concluded that the Darrow were going to lead them down further into night below and into a city run by the Mind Flayers. And that the Mind Flayers would basically eat their brains and that would be it. So the players end this session in manacles being led down to the city of the glass pool where the mind flayers rule uh that's a rhyme as soon as the session was over they started planning and trying to come up with a way while being led by the lords of the daryl by five let's say on average 10th level spellcasters down to the city of the glass pool how can we in manacles uh break out and escape or or overcome our captors which is terrible plan because they lost, the players lost against these same Darrow when they weren't manacled and captured. So what are they going to do now? As I was listening to them discuss what was going to happen, I realized we were in a very similar situation. And I thought, I know, I know what, I know what to do. I know what I'll do. I knew there was a point coming up where the heroes would be alone with a single mind flayer. And this would be their perfect opportunity to overcome this mind flayer and escape. But the players didn't know that. The players were desperate, and in their desperation, they were trying to come up with a way out of the situation they were in. And if they had tried something in that moment, they almost certainly would have been killed by the Darrow. I have a rule. You may have a different rule. I have a rule when it comes to bad guys capturing the heroes, which is the first time we capture you, we may try to ransom you back to your friends, or we may try to sell you into slavery. But if you escape, if you try to escape again, then we're just probably going to kill you because you're more trouble than you're worth. Of course, I could ditch that rule, and as a result, we wouldn't be in these situations in the first place. But to me, then, the, the bad guys start behaving in ways that I think of as implausible. And if you've been watching my series so far, you know that plausibility and verisimilitude is core to my philosophy. So I just went and talked to two of the players, the two that I thought of as being the most leader-like in the group. And I said, listen, um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to drop you into a cinematic and describe what happens. And at the end of that cinematic, you will be dumped out. I didn't tell them what was going to happen. You will be dumped out 
into a scenario where you will have a great opportunity to escape and it won't be five 10th level darrow guarding you it'll be you guys have the best opportunity to free yourselves and both of these players independently were like oh thank god they were both hugely relieved that they weren't going to try to find they didn't have to try to find a way to break out of their manacles and overcome these five spellcasters that had just smoked them that surprised me it surprised me that i the reason i asked them was because I thought they might not like the idea of giving up control over their characters for this this uh, non-gameplay, this narrative moment. But in point of fact, both players were hugely relieved, and it worked great, actually. The entire scenario played out exactly the way I would hope it would. We got together the next week. I said, I didn't tell the other players this, by the way. I was only talking to one or two of them as kind of sounding boards to see, is this a good idea? Is this going to work? And when both of them were like, oh, great, go for it. I was like, okay, good, let's do it. And I just described to them the process of being taken by the Darrow down to the Kotoa city and going through the gatehouse and being inspected and having their gear taken away from them, but never it was never that far from them. They could always see where it was. That's important, right? So the players don't start freaking out. Hey, we need our gear and then they're let they're they're delivered to a mind flayer in a laboratory and the mind flayer is all by himself and the darrow actually tried to tell this mind flayer these guys are not like the normal slaves and the mind flayer is like bah be gone with you you mad dwarves because of course the mind flayer thinks that he is the greatest uh, creation here in the underdark and that these little dwarves they don't know from danger who can't even listen to them once they were alone with this mind flayer the players immediately started planning ways they could escape and that was a lot of fun it was fun for me to watch and they correctly reasoned that even though this mind flayer had a mind blast that could affect the entire party, some of them would succeed at their saving throw. Anybody who was next to the Paladins or Lanivore would get plus five to their saving throw in, in, in addition to their normal bonuses. So one or two people are definitely going to make it. Graves is the empty one, and the empty one is immune to psionics. And as a result, he would definitely, and they start thinking, well, Graves can pretend that he was stunned. And that way, when the Mind Flayer comes up to eat his brains, Graves can attack him. And it, 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 everything played out exactly the way I would have hoped. There were a lot of interesting scenarios, moments where like it turned out the only person who could actually roll high enough, I think above an eight, to break out of their manacles was the wizard. So everyone else had to fight in their manacles, but Lars, as Sailor Bear Mantle, just turned into an Allosaurus and charged the Mind Flayer and started eating him while the rest of the players desperately tried to get out of their manacles, and they were able to cast spells. There were all sorts of rules I had about you know what spells you could cast and whether you were at advantage or disadvantage if you were in the manacles. And it was, it was, there was an element of it that was sort of like uh, watching the Marx Brothers as players tried to get out of line of sight in, in their manacles, tried to scurry around the room to get out of line, out of line of sight of the Mind Flayer's Mind Blast. But Lars, at Sailor Bear Mantle, the Allosaurus, very successfully ate the Mind Flayer, and that was it. It was, uh, it was dramatic. It was a lot of fun. The players went from a situation where they felt like they were trapped and hopeless and had no options to having a lot of fun and escaping quite dramatically. The problem in this state, the problem they were dealing with was I knew that there was a moment coming up that they'd be able to easily affect an escape, but they didn't. And that is what caused their desperation. And so they were about to do something that I thought was incredibly dumb. Let's try and fight these five arrow again, but this time we're going to be manacled and we don't have surprise. But you, you do things like that when you have no idea what's coming next, except they believed the certainty that the Mind Flayers would just eat their brains. The solution was simple, it was easy, it was fun. Deploy a cinematic, drop them into a non-gameplay state where they're just going to experience some narrative for a little while, and that all worked because the players trusted me. And part of them trusting me was because I went and talked to one or two of them ahead of time, and I just said, how do you guys feel about this? And they were both like, it's great. But part of my pitch was, I am going to drop you out in a scenario where you're going to have your best opportunity to escape. And they didn't know what that was, but that's all they needed to hear. There are certainly ways. We may do more videos about using cinematics. Uh, if I had more examples, I would use them. I want to make a short video covering the subject because I thought it was the most useful thing I could think of for you guys. But I think that there are definitely scenarios where using a cinematic is bad. You know, players don't like that feeling of having choice taken away from them. They don't like that notion of, but I would have done something, right? That's the thing you want to avoid. You want to avoid dropping them into a narrative state, a non-gameplay state, where the players object to the decisions that you're making for them their characters. That's why it worked in this situation, because there really weren't that many decisions to make other than get yourself in more trouble, which the players didn't want to do. So it may be an edge case, but it was a very successful use of a cinematic. It saved, in a certain sense, I'm sure it saved my campaign, especially having had that catastrophic failure earlier. That's it, folks. Short video on cinematics. We'll do more if I can think of 
more examples. But I think next video, we're going to do a little bit on politics. We've got, I think, three more politics videos. And your homework is to go play this game, Diplomacy, because that's what we're going to talk about in the next video. Literally, we're going to talk about this game because it is both a game and it is a subject matter. And it is the game that is the subject matter. They're the same thing in this instance. You'll see what I mean. As you all know, I don't have any ads in front of my D&D videos. If you want to help support the channel, come by my Amazon page. There's a link in the doobly-doo. I've got two books out. Uh, they're both five bucks. So if you buy both books, it costs you 10 bucks. And I think I get uh, eight bucks. And if you like D&D &D and you like fantasy, there's a good chance you'll get a kick out of the books. Oh, we did a video last week about initiatives, uh, an alternate initiative system from Mike Merles, lead designer of D&D, and how I intend on implementing it in my upcoming campaign, which you folks are going to get to watch from. We're going to roll characters live uh, sometime in September, I think. So you'll all get to see that from the ground floor. And it was a very popular video. It had the incredibly long and robust thread on my subreddit. And that made me really happy to see that. And it makes me want to do, I, I, I intended on doing more rules-based videos moving forward. But it also had the most dislikes of any video. I've done like three times. It's still not that many, but it's like three times as many dislikes as a normal video gets. And of course, that's because anytime I talk about house rules, some people are going to think that's a dumb rule. I don't like it. Dislike. And the fact that overwhelmingly, even people that don't want to use that initiative system didn't do that makes me very happy. It means we're all in one way or another, sort of adults, and we're able to encounter new ideas and not like them, but not punish the messenger. So that we're going to keep doing this, and we're going to make more videos, at least I think, at least one I know of, maybe two moving forward, not the next videos, but between now and September, of interesting house rules, at least I think they're interesting, that I am going to be using. That's the theme, is they're all house rules that I am going to be using in my upcoming campaign. And the next one, I think, is going to be something I'm taking and stealing from another game and modifying it to suit myself called The Party Sheet. And if you know what game that's from, you may already have some kind of inkling as to what I intend on doing with it. No spoilers. All right, folks, that's it. Until next time, peace. Out.